Okay, well, why don't we get started and we'll put uh, additional instructions in the chat if anybody comes in late and misses these instructions. So welcome to the LTER Synthesis webinar for today. Um, I'm Jen Cassell from the LTER Network Office and together with Marty Downs, who's here um, from the, the director of the Network Office, we're so pleased um, to introduce our speakers for today. Um, who will be talking about ecosystem responses to climate change across the LTR sites. So we have um, two speakers, a joint presentation today from Julia Jones, and Julia is a, a distinguished professor and she's director of geography at Oregon State University. Um, Julia is a longtime co-investigator of Andrews Forest LTR and, and her research studies long-term effects of climate and forest management and disturbance on stream flow, biogeochemistry, and ecology. And Julia has led the LTER um, uh, Climate Committee and the associated efforts on climate and hydrology synthesis across the LTR sites uh, since 2009. And presenting with Julia today um, will be Charlie Driscoll. And Charlie's a distinguished uh, university professor of environmental systems engineering at Syracuse University. Um, and Charlie's probably best known for his work on environmental chemistry, biogeochemistry, and environmental engineering, um, as well as aquatic chemistry and water quality monitoring. Charlie's a former PI, and he's currently co-PI of, former lead PI, and currently co-PI of the Hubbard Brook LTR, and has a long history with the LTR programs as well. Um, and so today, uh, Julia and um, Charlie will be uh, speaking to us about ecosystem response uh, to climate change at the LTR sites. And hopefully, Julia and Charlie will be talking about the, um, the paper that's just out that this work is based on. So a little bit of housekeeping for the attendees. If you would like to ask questions, you can use the, and we prefer you use the Q&A uh, button, I guess you'd call it, down at the bottom of your screen. And please, you can write questions as you have them at any time throughout the presentation. A little known fact about the Q&A is that you can upvote questions. So if you have the same question as somebody else, go ahead and look for the little thumbs up uh, and you can just upvote that question and the, it will rise to the top and then at the end we'll, we'll cover these questions. So no need to type the exact same question as somebody else. Um, look for additional instructions or if you're having any issues uh, with a webinar in the chat. And I think that's pretty much it. So let's get started. I won't take any more time. I think Charlie and Julia, over to you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Jen. And um, good morning or afternoon to all of you, depending on, on where you are. Um, so as Jen said, we're going to tell you a little bit about a synthesis effort that's been underway uh, for a while since the last all scientist meeting at uh, across LTER sites. And so I think most of the audience is familiar with LTER, but in case there's a few out there, uh, this is a slide just to, to give some uh, perspective. Uh, so the LTER sites, there are uh, 28 sites uh, across uh, the US and outside the US. Um, the work for LTR is place-based um, and really looking at questions over long time scales and taking that site-based work and trying to put it in a regional perspective. It's a very diverse community of ecosystem scientists um, and it's very interdisciplinary in nature and there are outreach efforts for environmental policy uh, management and education. Sort of the keys to the LTER uh, and what holds the program together is research around the five core areas, which include populations, communities, primary production, detrital, uh, organic matter, and inorganic uh, cycles, as well as effects of disturbance. Uh, next slide. So uh, following the last uh, all scientists meeting, uh, there were really some terrific uh, presentations and hats off to Julia for organizing that meeting and meetings that had occurred at other all scientists meetings. Um, and it seemed like there was such a lot of good work done across sites that it was worthwhile to try to put that in paper. So we have a series of papers that are, um, pretty much completed uh, and are scheduled uh, 
for publication in bioscience, hopefully uh, this spring or summer, so hopefully fairly soon. So this is the conceptual model that we developed to try to pull this all together. And um, so we considered sort of uh, climate change drivers across the LTR sites. And so global scale changes in greenhouse, greenhouse gases that affects on uh, global uh, air temperature and changes in circulation. And those are manifested into local uh, impacts in terms of local changes in temperature all through precipitation. Uh, changes in, in, in moisture for ecosystems. And those drive into different sort of site level environmental forcings. Uh, so uh, due to temperature moisture stress, um, rising sea level, um, altered wind patterns, currents, changes in stratification for uh, coastal and marine systems and lake systems, and then increases in extreme events like floods and wildfires and droughts. And then those cascade back down to ecosystem responses, which is really the guts of the LTR site level work, uh, really across the five core areas. And then, of course, we're looking at uh, disturbance associated with climatic events. But many of these sites are heavily influenced by other disturbance regimes, such as air pollution or invasives or overfishing, a whole host of uh, site specific uh, responses. And then finally, we're interested in how those translate to ecosystem services. And of course, within this overall framework, there are these feedbacks to the uh, overall climate system that we're particularly interested in. So we, we have this general framework across these sites. Next slide. Okay, as I mentioned, there's 28 uh, LTER sites. We were very pleased that we got very strong participation across all the sites. Uh, we divided those up into groups for the various papers. And uh, so this is a map showing you the location of the LTER sites. Next slide. Okay, so we organized this for good or for bad across these general topics, or these general types of ecosystems. We did get pushback on some of these, not only from the people who were participating, but also from our reviewers. It's really hard to put LTR sites in boxes, but we, we tried for purposes of having five uh, papers. And so uh, there's an overview uh, paper, and then there are four broad uh, sort of ecosystem type papers, including marine pelagic, which is led by Hugh Ducklow of Columbia and uh, included all the investigators that work on open marine sites. And then uh, land coastal margin suite of sites. Uh, so these are, this was led by uh, Dan Reed, who was at Santa Barbara and uh, included a whole host of uh, PIs who are working in these types of ecosystems. And then the next were dry lands that was led by Amy Hudson, who is a research associate at Ornata, and again included a large number of uh, investigators who work on dry land sites. And then finally, we had uh, forest and freshwater. That was led by John Campbell, who's with the Forest Service and works at Hubbard Brook. He works with actually Julie and I a lot, both of us. And uh, there's a lot of uh, work on streams and freshwater systems. So that was a collection of sites. And so, um, yeah, so what we're going to do here today is we're going to present some overview patterns, and then we're going to walk through some of the highlights from each of these, and then we're going to talk a little bit about next steps. We're hopeful for uh, another uh, all scientists meeting where there could be a climate focus and we're interested in continuing this cross site work, which I think Julie and I, I think I speak for her to say that we feel it's really critical for the network to do work aggressively on cross site work It really uh, it brings out a lot of very interesting patterns and questions that I think are, are worthwhile to pursue. Next slide. Okay, I don't, we don't want to dwell on methods, but just a little bit, just so we're all up to speed. So we used uh, gridded uh, temperature data over for each of the sites across uh, different intervals uh, from uh, 1900 to 2020. We looked at anomalies over the uh, period from uh, 1951 to 1980. 
Another uh, driver that we looked at is something known as SPEI. So those of you who are non-hydrologists, that stands for Standardized Precipitation and Evaporation uh, Index. And so what this is, is the difference between precipitation inputs and evapotranspiration losses. And again, this was done across uh, the sites where this was relevant or 22 of the uh, terrestrial sites uh, over the period from 1900 to 2018. We looked at um, uh, long-term changes of temperature, air temperature through three intervals, 1930 to 2020, 1950 to 2020, and then really the LTR interval 1980 to 2020. We also looked for extreme temperature changes in terms of absolute temperature change. So that monthly value of an increase in temperature of greater than two degrees centigrade for the period of 1980 to, to, 20, to 1920 relative to values that we've seen over the 20th century. And then also a relative change. In other words, a change in the 90th percentile of the temperature observations over the 20th century. Next slide. Okay, so this gets into a little bit of the uh, sort of cross-site analysis across the whole network. This shows you sort of what we're looking at. This is color-coded for different types of systems, the marine pelagic site, the coastal sites, the dry land sites, the forest sites, and shows you the range that we see across these sites in mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation. So it's an impressive array of sites showing very, very different climatic conditions. And that's, I think, a, a strength of the LTR network and, and what we try to take advantage of in this synthesis. Next slide. Okay, briefly, some of the trends. These are showing the, the long-term temperature trends over the sort of reference period of 1930 to 1920 over the y-axis compared to the changes from 1980 to to, to 2020 over the over the y-axis and you can see all the sites color-coded by the type of site that we put them in and the degree of change that we see so we see most of the most of the LTR sites are showing pretty pronounced uh, temperature changes uh, in the current interval or with the reference interval and many of the sites have more than doubled in their rate of warming next slide This slide is a little complicated. It's really to try to look at sort of extremes in temperature for these um, monthly warming trends. And so we have along the uh, x-axis, the absolute change in, uh, in air temperature across the sites. And the y-axis is the relative change in temperature across sites. So we get sort of a, an interesting dynamic across the LTR sites. So sites like uh, Luquillo and Morea and uh, Florida coastal uh, site are showing relatively high relative changes in temperature, but relatively small absolute changes in temperature. Where if we look across sites, particularly in the uh, in the Arctic and Antarctic, those sites are showing relatively large uh, uh, absolute changes in temperature. So you can see where all the various sites fit in terms of uh, these types of extreme temperature changes. Next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna move on into the sort of focused areas and I'm gonna do the marine pelagic. So these are the, uh, the five marine pelagic sites. Next slide. So we've got these sort of uh, smaller sub presentations organized along the conceptual diagram that I showed early on. So what are the various types of environmental forcings that we see for marine pelagic sites? Well, we certainly see sea surface uh, warming. We see in the Arctic and Antarctic site loss of sea, light, sea ice. We see changes in the hydrodynamics associated with increases in, in glacial mount and freshwater inputs, changes in, in currents and mixing. So we're really an interesting uh, array of uh, shifts in environmental forcing. And then across the various ecosystems, we see ecosystem level responses. And some of these are, are illustrated here. And it's interesting, all the various sites have different types of additional disturbances beyond climatic disturbances. In the, came, in the case of these marine sites, certainly 
overfishing is a is a big problem and and cessation of whaling uh, or or whaling and the introduction of microplastics uh, are prominent issues that these sites are addressing. Next slide. Okay, just a couple of little uh, things in terms of just to give you a, a tidbit on the uh, on the data changes. These are sort of time series analyses uh, relative to the reference site starting, the reference period starting in 1930. So you can see that all the sites um, are showing pretty significant changes in, in warming, but the greatest degree of change in warming is occurring at the, at the extremes in, in, in latitudes. Next slide. And then a little bit in terms of changes. So many of the sites where there are long-term data are showing changes in the sort of mixed layer depth associated with surface warming and strengthening of stratification. So you can see that the three of the four sites where there are long-term records are showing decreases in the mixed layer depth. And then in terms of how that translates and how that plays out in terms of biotic response, even though they're showing this consistent pattern, there are differences in response. So we can see in the California current um, and in the Gulf of Alaska, no significant change in chlorophyll, where we see uh, you know, decreases and increases in chlorophyll at the other sites. So contrasting patterns given this, these changes in mixing. So I think that that's my last slide, Julia, is that right? And then we're handing it off to Julia and she's gonna cover the other sites and give you some concluding remarks. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the other three groups of sites. Uh, first coastal, then we'll do dry lands and then we'll do the forest and freshwater sites. So <clears throat> as you probably may know, the coastal sites uh, <clears throat> include a number of different types of ecosystems, including coral reefs, um, kelp forests, seagrass ecosystems, freshwater wetlands, as in Florida, dune systems, barrier islands, and um, salt marshes. And so um, if we look at the kinds of responses that are occurring, <clears throat> they're experiencing a wide range of different types of environmental forcing, including sea level rise and saltwater intrusion, <clears throat> increased storm surges, but also altered upwelling, ocean acidification, and hypoxia reductions in oxygen. <clears throat> and uh, well, there's a wide variety of ecosystem responses to these environmental forcings at the different sites in the Everglades. Uh, there's notable peat collapse and some migration of mangrove forests at Santa Barbara Coastal. <clears throat> um, increased wave height has been associated with kelp damage. At um, the Virginia Coastal Res Reserve, <clears throat> there's been shoreward migration of woody shrubs. And at Georgia Coastal, there's been dieback of salt marshes. And at Morea, <clears throat> a combination of storm disturbance and coral bleaching have occurred. And during these changes, of course, they've coincided with ongoing other human actions and legacies associated with fishing, the extirpation of marine mammals, coastal development, <clears throat> and altered sediment and nutrient dynamics. Here's a figure from the coastal <clears throat> uh, paper on these, um, this synthesis. And this shows trends over time in a number of ecologically relevant uh, variables measured at several of the uh, coastal LTER sites. And what's interesting here is that, you know, some things are flat, some things are going down, some things are going up, some things are bouncing around. And also, <clears throat> in some cases, the trends observed at the LTER site match a regional trend or variability, as in the top two diagrams. In the middle two diagrams, the local site is either more variable or less variable than the region, <laughs> or <clears throat> in the bottom uh, two examples, the local site may have a less pronounced trend or a more pronounced trend than is observed uh, relative <clears throat> to what's going on in the region. 
Another thing that's interesting from the coastal sites is <clears throat> heat, the effect of heat waves. Um, as the bottom diagram shows, this is the long-term GISS temperature anomaly <clears throat> on a monthly basis for the two degree cell that contains the Virginia Coast Reserve. And you can see that there was a marine heat wave. <clears throat> so these are sea surface temperatures and there was a marine heat wave in 2012 that coincided with a, uh, an eelgrass restoration experiment. <clears throat> and an interesting finding is that even five years after the heat wave, there was still um, <clears throat> reduced density in the upper layers of um, the eelgrass restoration experiment, apparently as a result of the heat wave. Um, as we move into thinking about the more terrestrial sites, uh, one of the th things that we did um, was we plotted the changes in uh, temperature on the x-axis. And I, I don't know why the degree sign shows up as an asterisk, but that should be a degree, a degree <laughs> sign. And uh, we, we plotted the change in temperature, the rate of temperature change over the LTER period to the moisture change over the LTER period. And <clears throat> you can see that, you know, roughly half or a little more than half of the sites are getting wetter and some are getting drier. Um, and what you can see is that the Alaskan sites are off in the upper, <clears throat> have the higher rates of uh, temperature change um, for uh, among all the LTER sites. If we sort of zoom in and flip the axes a little bit and put moisture on the x-axis and temperature change on the y-axis, you can see that for most of the continental United States, as you might not be surprised, there is an inverse relationship between moisture changes and temperature changes with <clears throat> more rapid rates of warming in the sites that have also had less precipitation over the LTER period. <clears throat> and then it's also interesting that these New England sites are sort of a little bit outside of the cloud indicating that they are <clears throat> getting wetter, but they're also warming uh, somewhat more rapidly than other sites that are experiencing similar wetness changes. So if we think about then these differences and we go and look at the dryland sites, <clears throat> we have a wide range of different types of sites in the dryland group from Arctic tundra to old field succession at Cedar Creek to current agricultural enterprises at Kellogg, tall grass prairie at Kanza, the dry valleys <clears throat> of McMurdo in Antarctica, the Phoenix area, um, and um, the desert systems of Hornada and Sevilleta. And so we see a, a wide range of different types of environmental forcings in these dry land sites. Some sites are experiencing moisture stress, while others are experiencing more wetness or more wet to dry extremes. Uh, some sites are experiencing droughts, while others are getting flooding and there is wind erosion and fire at some of the sites. So for example, we see that, you know, with the loss of permafrost and heating of the air in the north slope of Alaska, there's shrub invasion, fire and losses, fire in the tundra, losses of carbon and nitrogen. In the southwestern sites, <clears throat> There are changes in production, primary production associated with changes in precipitation, as well as increase in fire and dust. And in Antarctica and McMurdo, there are glacial melt floods with effects <clears throat> all the way down to the uh, lake communities um, in that ecosystem. And at the same time, these places continue to be affected by human activities in the present and the past, including <coughs> clearing, vegetation clearing, agriculture, field abandonment, the extirpation of native, gra native grazers and the introduction of domestic grazers, disturbances to the soil, water diversion, <clears throat> and urban and exurban development. 
you know, a closer look at what's going on in the dryland sites sort of <clears throat> emphasizes this interesting opportunity within the LTER network to contrast sites in the southwestern US, which have been substantially drier <clears throat> in the latter part of the LTER period than they were in the beginning part of the LTER period, <clears throat> apparently as a result of a fairly well-known teleconnection that um, by which the precipitation regime in the Southwest <clears throat> is connected to uh, the sea surface temperature in the Northern Pacific. Um, whereas in the upper Midwest, <clears throat> the LTER period has been somewhat wetter than the 50 years prior to that. Um, and in the Arctic, <laughs> the LTER period coincides with a substantially drier period than the 50 years before that time. So there's a very long and um, respected tradition of work within the LTR network synthesizing <clears throat> primary production across dry ecosystems and their connections to precipitation. And one of the interesting things that emerges from this dry land synthesis is that as precipitation and <clears throat> Uh, and temperature are both changing in these ecosystems. Uh, it may be that precipitation is changing its, its role as a driver of primary production. So some of the sites have fairly strong relationships of primary production to precipitation, although there's still quite a bit of scatter, while others have pretty weak relationships. And then if you look in the more recent <clears throat> time series in the past, decade or two, you can see that in some cases, a relationship that seemed to be closely tied to precipitation may in fact <clears throat> be changing. So that's an interesting area for future work. Um, lastly, we have the nine um, forest and freshwater LTER sites, which include <clears throat> the subalpine forests of uh, Niwot, uh, the deciduous forests at Hubbard Brook, the um, conifer temperate evergreen forests, rainforests of the Pacific Northwest at the Andrews, uh, deciduous <clears throat> forests in Coweta, and uh, Harvard forest in New England, um, the North Temperate Lakes ecosystems in central Wisconsin, <clears throat> the Baltimore ecosystems, um, the, temp the tropical rainforest of Lukio, and the boreal forest of Bonanza Creek in Alaska. And these sites are experiencing a range of uh, different types of environmental forcing. <clears throat> Those sites with snow are experiencing, or snow and ice are experiencing loss of snow and loss of permafrost, <clears throat> but also increased moisture and heat stress. But other sites are getting wetter and having <clears throat> a higher frequency of intense storms, including hurricanes, floods, ice storms, uh, while other sites are experiencing more drought <clears throat> and wildfire. So we see a wide range of different types of ecosystem responses with only three <clears throat> sort of examples featured here where at Lukio, uh, there's interesting responses of stream nitrate <clears throat> and stream organisms to, uh, to hurricanes, to the succession of three hurricanes that have happened in the LTER period. Uh, in North Temperate Lakes, we see changes in cold water fish <clears throat> abundance and the Harvard forest, interesting case of um, hemlock loss from invasion of the woolly adelgid. <clears throat> but Forest sites are very heavily affected by human activities, as, as are the other LTER sites, including forest clearing, agriculture, grazing, forest regeneration, <clears throat> logging and road construction, fire suppression, um, atmospheric deposition, and introduced pests and species and pathogens. So in the forest and freshwater paper, one of the things that was examined was how <clears throat> changes in moisture are influencing changes in stream flow and how this plays out across the range of LTER sites. And as you might not be too surprised to discover, <clears throat> the sites which are getting wetter are also exper experiencing increased 
uh, stream flow, generally speaking, and those that are <clears throat> not getting wetter or even slightly drier are experiencing decreases in stream flow. The exception being Bonanza Creek, where <clears throat> it's not just the changes in the atmosphere, but the permafrost. So despite dry, a drier atmosphere, the permafrost change is slightly increasing stream flow in that ecosystem. The forests and freshwater sites also have really impressive records of a long-term ice cover, which show um, increasingly late ice on and increasingly early ice off dates <clears throat> over time, and um, just underscore the way in which these different sites are predominantly the forest and freshwater sites <clears throat> based on the number of disaster declarations in the counties in which these sites are located, uh, they're characterized by flooding, hurricanes, uh, severe storms, and, and snow weather. So <clears throat> we also tried to look at how these ecosystem responses uh, affect ecosystem services and uh, all of the ecosystem services are being affected one way or another by these changes in climate and ecosystem processes. <clears throat> Just as some examples, marine heat waves are having an effect on primary production um, <clears throat> in marine and coastal areas, while forest disturbance and heat is obviously changing forest carbon and nitrogen storage. <clears throat> in the dryland sites, increased wind erosion and smoke is jeopardizing health, a regulatory, a regulating ecosystem service. And in coastal ecosystems, increased wave height and loss of, loss of coastal vegetation <clears throat> is reducing storm protection. Um, we can find examples of um, deterioration of provisioning ecosystem services in all four types of LTER sites, including loss of shellfish due to ocean acidification, changes in fisheries due to ocean circulatory changes, changes in <clears throat> timber and fiber availability associated with forest disturbance, and changes in grain and meat production <clears throat> associated with disturbances uh, like drought and floods in the dryland systems. The sites also are experiencing changes in cultural ecosystem services. And then there are feedbacks to the physical properties of the ecosystem. And also um, some of our reviewers really um, pointed out that a lot of these ecosystem service changes <clears throat> may affect human behavior and attitudes toward climate change, which may, which may also feed back to affect the climate system. So the lessons that come from this work are that ecosystem responses to climate change are evident everywhere. In many cases, they are just emerging. They, are, they seem to be accelerating. Um, a key factor that extends across many of the LTER sites is the role of changes in the phase of water from ice to liquid or liquid to vapor. <clears throat> For example, the way in which Increased freshwater flows from the Greenland ice sheet are impacting the Northeast Shelf LTER, how drought is affecting dust storms <clears throat> in Phoenix, or how changes in temperature, which affect the timing of snowmelt, may affect the survival of Adeli penguin chips, chicks in, uh, at Palmer. And it also means that it's going to be ch quite challenging to make predictions of ecosystem response to climate change. Um, the, the ecosystem effects are most clear in, in locations or circumstances under which there is a rapid change or severe disturbance and where the uh, effects of human disturbance are small or human activities are small, it's easiest to see the linkages between climate change and ecosystems. But most ecosystem responses are highly local. They vary by latitude, by region, <clears throat> in terrestrial versus aquatic, land versus water sites. They depend on the type of environmental forcing that's happening. 
They interact with non-climate non related human activities. They produce cascades of interactions and these effects play out over centuries. So that means we need LTER to keep <laughs> on doing this kind of work and to keep on synthesizing it. A, a long-term ecosystem perspective is absolutely essential for understanding the effects of climate change. Climate change is irreversible at this point. <clears throat> and there are very few entities that have the ability that the LTER network has to understand how climate change has affected and will continue to affect our ecosystems, especially considering how many different kinds of ecosystems we have in the network <clears throat> and the way in which they're being affected by a variety of environmental forcings and how these ecosystem changes depend on the legacies from past and current human actions. LTER also has this wonderful collaborative and sustained research community or communities, which enable us to look at changes in our sites and compare them to changes regionally and to document, document both expected or anticipated consequences of climate change as well as unexpected changes. So for the LTER network, there are a number of steps that <clears throat> we hope we will all take together. Uh, the first one being this uh, bioscience special issue, which Charlie mentioned of five papers, the findings of some of which were very briefly described in this talk. Um, there'll be a presentation <clears throat> at ESA this year, and we wonder about whether uh, the network might um, muster itself to run a session at next year's ESA on this. <clears throat> We're looking at the possibility of trying to um, write a short article for EOS about the 40 year review of um, climate change at LTER sites. And we've proposed a track of three workshops for the September 2022 All Scientists meeting where the objective is to promote ongoing synthesis and to engage early career and diverse researchers at all LTER sites to carry on this work of synthesis and understanding <clears throat> and to also consider social and environmental justice issues, which might possibly lead to uh, perhaps a proposal for some kind of NCs working group activity in the future. Um, so with that, I think I'll just conclude by showing you um, some pictures of the Andrews Forest and thanking the National Science Foundation for its amazing support of the long-term ecological research program for the past 40, almost 42 years. So thanks. So thank you so much, Charlie and Julia, for such an informative and, and wide, broad reaching um, body of work across the LTR, it was super fascinating. Um, so we have a, a couple questions already in the Q&A and one in the chat, and I will we'll get to those, but I'll also let the attendees know that we have um, several ways to ask questions. You can type them into the Q&A, but also we have a small enough group today at this point at least that if you would like to verbally ask a question, then raise your hand and I can get over there and I can actually unmute you and we can start a conversation if we'd like, which I think could be really fun and really useful. Um, so Charlie and Julia, um, I'll let you, I'll, I'll read the questions and not address them to one or the other of you, you guys can decide. But so Lucas Silva, asks in the chat, um, and this was in relation to an earlier slide in the presentation, based on the strong and widespread warming trends, I conclude that HJA's temperature record, which uh, shows no significant warming, is an outlier. Can that ex be explained solely by the forest stand growing near the Met Station, um, i.e. maybe a local microclimate buffering effect, or is, and do you know of any publications reporting that effect? So HJA is an outlier. Oh, so that's a really interesting question. Thanks, Lucas. You know, we 
For a long time, the last decade or more, we tried to work across LTER sites to see what we could learn about climate change based on climate records collected at LTER sites. And it became evident that the variety of uh, methods used to measure climate at the LTER sites and the fact that they had not been homogenized with a global, global historical climate data network meant that we couldn't really use uh, those records. And so for this work, we used the um, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, two degree records of um, temperature, which are <clears throat> composed from um, global historical climate network meteorological stations, which have been homogenized and from sea surface temperatures. So the smaller increase in temperature at the Andrews Forest, for example, is not a result of a problem with meteorological station measurements, but is consistent with what is shown by these long-term records of slightly lesser rates of warming based on annual temperature data. <clears throat> Whereas uh, if we look at rates of warming by month of the year, which we did in Charlie's and my paper, <clears throat> it, it'll be in the supplement. We see that in many sites, the warming is concentrated during certain times of the year. And uh, many LTER sites show relatively high warming during the summertime. And that's true at the Andrews Forest as well. Great, thanks, Julia. Um, there's another question in the Q&A from Janice or, or Giannis Gro. Does water from non-rainfall events, for example, dew, fog, water vapor adsorption, play a role in dry land ecosystems? I don't know. What do you think, Julia? Can you take that, or? Yeah, I think I think it does. I mean. I think Amy Hudson may be attending the web webinar and she would be a better person to answer this question on behalf of dry land ecosystems. But I can simply say that in the case of the Andrews Forest, um, which has very dry summers, there is increasing interest in looking at the role of dewfall as a, a moisture source that may mitigate uh, moisture stress, both to trees and presumably also to desert plants during dry periods. But also uh, dew formation may be compromised as nighttime temperature increases um, due the, the, uh, dew, the dew point may, um, the temperature may rise above the dew point and so dew sources may become reduced over time. And so these are important questions to look at. Yeah. So, so Julia, can you comment a little bit on how well we're, we're looking? I mean, I agree, this is really an interesting question. Are, do you know, are people looking at this across the sites as, a, as an important mechanism that is sort of understudied? I think, it, I think it would be very interesting to see how many sites are looking at that as a mechanism. I know that there is some early work on this at the Andrews Forest, but I think um, maybe that's something we should add as a question for our <clears throat> participants in the working group. Um, and so Marty and Jen, remind me, Remind us to make an advertisement about the all scientists meeting before we sign off. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I'll note it. So Sarah Thompson ha um, raised her hand and Sarah, we made you a panelist. Um, so you can actually speak now. You're, um, you have to unmute yourself. And then after Sarah, we'll actually demote you again, just so you know, don't take it personally to attendee. <laughs> okay, Sarah, can you unmute yourself and ask? Okay, I'm not hearing. Oh, do we still have to do that? Marty, she's a panelist, so. Okay, well, we'll give Sarah a, a chance to figure that out. Sarah, if you can hear us, you're a panelist now and you can just unmute yourself and talk. And in the meantime, um, Samantha has asked a question in the Q&A. Um, did the synthesis reveal any new topics or measurements of interest to the sites, such as things they now want to observe given the trends observed at other sites? 
So, you know, could, could this work inform the potential start of new time series or, or other? Well, maybe right. I can take a crack at that and then Julia, I'm sure can amplify, but I think it's been very useful. I mean, to some extent, it's, it's a painful process. I mean, because you get people together and they all have different perspectives and we really need to sort of put aside our individual site hat and look at sort of the, the overall overall patterns. But I think it, um, I, I think that there were a, a lot of questions. There are some interesting patterns, but you know, I think we pointed out, Julia pointed out that these uh, sort of anomalous warming in some of the sites in the Eastern US, what, what is driving that? Um, sometimes we saw, we expected to see patterns or expected to see consistencies and we, we did not see them. Um, and I think as Julia also mentioned, we're really interested in, in drilling down if we, if we go forward with this and I hope we would to, to really start to look at the ecosystem services and look at communities that are really sort of disproportionately influenced by, by our changing climate. Um, so I think those are some of the things that we're, you know, that we're, we're thinking about and keying up for a, for a future effort. But Julia, I'm sure you've got a few other ideas. Well, maybe I'll transition into answering that and sort of answering a question that Matt Betts put in the chat window, which was he asked, you know, did, did we try to <clears throat> synthesize changes in populations and communities across the network? And uh, if not, I got you on paper or electrons, Matt, for volunteering to organize that. <laughs> um, but um, this, I think the, I think it's too early to say, and this is why I think it's really important for all sites to send a half a dozen people to the um, working group at the all scientists meeting about this because I think when, I predict that when the papers come out, people will start to think about what they should be measuring differently. And I also think that they may inspire, I, I hope they will inspire additional work because what we, we felt when we were doing this work um, with our colleagues across all five of the papers, we felt that we were just barely beginning to scrape the surface of what the LTER network can has to say about this topic and that there's a great deal more that could be uh, derived from work that has already been done or work that could be done by new types of measurements or new ways of synthesizing them in the future. Yes, and on that note, I'm envisioning maybe proposals to the next call for the N for the LTER synthesis working groups to be held at NC. So we'll be um, opening up a new RFP in the spring on that, and it'll have a very long. Uh, we don't know when the due date will be, but it will be a long time period with plenty of time to um, talk about it at the ASM and think about proposal writing. So we would be very thrilled to encourage proposals in that area. So thanks, Julia, for the plug on that. Um, there's another question in the chat from Yadang and um, wants to know if you could maybe discuss temperature change over the years in the LTR urban sites. So no specific um, topic, but just maybe, yeah, maybe reflections on what was happening in the urban sites with regard to temperature change. Do you want to take that, Julia? You want me to take it? Give it a, why don't you, you start and then I'll chime in. Yeah, I guess we were a little surprised uh, that there were more, not more distinct patterns um, across the urban sites because of uh, sort of urban heat, heat island effects, um, or maybe that they were not more, more prominent um, because that's fairly well, uh, fairly well documented. And it may have to do with sort of the spatial resolution of the temperature. It's a relatively coarse resolution. And so that maybe something that we would need to do is to try to align this sort of coarse scale resolution, which we thought that there were would be huge advantages associated with doing this in terms of doing cross-site work, but maybe some of the fine details. You know, another um, thing along the same lines that was a, a surprise to me was that I was anticipating uh, greater changes at the montane sites than, than we saw. And again, that may be due to just the, um, 
the coarseness of the temperature resolution. But Julia, why don't you chime in? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. You know, there there ha has been a lot of work about the topic of microclimate in a variety of different types of ecosystems, and the data that we used. I mean, it's two degree latitude cells. These are very coarse data and we use them because they're consistent and they do show what's really interesting is that they show that even at that coarse scale, there's some pretty big differences among LTER sites in terms of the <clears throat> temperature and moisture forcing that they're experiencing. But at the same time, we also know that there are many other phenomena operating at finer <clears throat> spatial and temporal scales that are affecting ecosystem processes. And so I think it's really important for each LTER site to think about <clears throat> the different phenomena that affect heating and cooling and wetting and drying at different scales within those ecosystems, which would include, for example, cities or certain places and cities are much more likely <clears throat> to be exposed to extreme heat or to intensified flooding because of pavement and those kinds of phenomena. So I think th that's a place where I could imagine LTER doing a better job at, you know, building some kind of a space time conceptual model of the different climate change phenomena that might <clears throat> overlay onto different types of ecosystem responses. So it's a great question and a, a good challenge for us. Okay, um, I don't, oh wait, I, I think there's another question. Oh yeah, there is one more question coming in um, from Mark. Can you, did you see any evidence of a single or, or groups of species responses at sites to the changes either um, mitigating the overall ecosystem response or exacerbating the overall response? For example, species that may be important to monitor, trees providing microclimates and so forth. And that's a little bit complex. It's in the Q&A if you want to read it as well. It was a good question, Mark. That's a great question. <clears throat> I think it's highly likely that species are responding in ways that could either mitigate or exacerbate responses. But what I think was interesting as we commented toward the end of our talk is if you think about the long-term change, you know, there were for that 1930 to 1980 period of very modest warming at LTER sites. And then the rates of climate change have <clears throat> maybe doubled in the last 40 years to rates something in the neighborhood of 0.2 degrees C per decade, right? So these are not super fast changes. And so what that means is that we, we need to watch out for opportunities like disturbances or heat waves or other phenomena, and then try to track how populations and communities and carbon cycling and inorganic cycling is, is responding. And so what that means is that the work on these kinds of topics is really just beginning to emerge from LTERs because the phenomena, we have to wait for the phenomena to happen and we have to watch them like that heat wave in 2012 at Virginia Coast Reserve and then go back and keep measuring things for years and see how they respond. <clears throat> so I think it's really an important challenge and something for all LTER sites to keep in mind. Charlie, you, you work so much on these long-term phenomena like you know, lakes and how long it takes them to respond. Do you have some things to add? Well, I think that's good. And, and probably across these sites, we saw, and I think you, you saw that in the slides, different sites have certain different key species that they are that they're focusing on to try to, you know, as, as indicators of, of change. Um, I mean, we, we haven't really tried to synthesize that too much and sort of look what are the attributes of these indicators and why they're selected. We've just sort of accepted what the sites are doing, but maybe we could, we could drill down and, and try to uh, look into that into a little greater detail going forward. Great. I just want to 
Oh yeah, Marty. I want to call out, I put it in the chat, but there was an ecosphere special issue last year with a focus on uh, primarily on populations. And some of it's a little anecdotal, I, I think because of exactly what Julia was saying, but um, I, it's a pretty good place to start and there's a ton of work that could be done building on that. I think getting getting beyond anecdote is really a challenge for us in LTER, but but climate change really calls on us. And I think the LTER network has an opportunity to be a spokesperson or a spokes group to, to our whole country about ecosystem responses to climate change. There's no other group of scientists who have this kind of knowledge and understanding of long-term ecosystem dynamics. And there really is no other venue where these kinds of topics are being discussed. So I really think it, we, there are tremendous possibilities for the LTER at 40 years in its fifth decade to pull together this kind of work <clears throat> and to, to really meet this challenge as a group, as a network with, with help from the communications office and the program officers and the LTER executive committee and science council and all those entities and the all scientists meeting. Right, I think you're getting some here here's in the um, mm -hmm. in the chat, for sure. Um, I think that was a, a, a real we're coming to the end of an of the hour um, here, but if you can hang on Charlie and Julia, we can for sure. four minutes because yeah. there's some questions. Okay, great. For those of you who have to drop off, though, and I, I understand we're at the top of the hour, we've put a lot of links to upcoming um, events as well as relevant papers in the chat. So have a look at those. Um, the next month will be the last uh, webinar of this webinar series on plant reproduction um, and and so forth. So I, I know many of you probably have to drop off. So um, there's another question in the Q and A by Fred uh, Swanson: Are LTER and NSF configured to take on the challenges of keeping this work up going forward? <laughs> Okay, Charlie, you take that one. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a loaded question to me, but uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can. Uh, I, I, I really was impressed with the way that the community came together. I mean, it really started at the all scientists meeting. I think people were really jazzed to see these interesting patterns across these sites, and you know, sort of associated stories. And I think that that has. Uh, has led to you know developing these papers, and I mean, if you look at the the list of co-authors, it's pretty impressive. I mean, we've got people from all these sites, and I think you know, and I think that they a lot you can you can tell this from the questions that we're getting from this presentation. There's a lot of, I mean, we're just as as Julia says, scratching the surface, and so I think there are a lots and lots of possibilities, and I think we have to redouble our efforts towards uh, cross-site work and really take advantage of what the LTR has to offer. It's, it's hard work because these sites are so different, but the, the level of detail that we see across these sites is really amazing. I think we have to provide um, understanding of the linkages for these, for this, what we're seeing, the patterns that we're seeing at these sites, are they relevant across regions? And if, if they are, that's interesting, but if they're not, that's also interesting. So I think that we, um, we're we in a very good position to do this type of detailed work. And I think it's really critical in terms of understanding uh, how climate is, is affecting the function of our ecosystems and the structure of our ecosystems and how that cascades on to effects on, on, on people. Um, so yeah, I think it's great stuff. And hopefully, um, you know, we will continue this work and it will be and envisioned that it's going to be supported by NSF, and um, yeah, I'm 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 optimistic. This is uh, just really a first step in an important effort for the network. Yeah, I so in, I think I just want to read a comment from Samantha Weintraub Leff, uh, kind of in response to what both of you just um, concluded with, which is. You know, so true agreement, but we also need some positive stories to tell as well. What can we learn about ecosystems to help increase resiliency, restoration, et cetera? And I think everyone seems like on this call would agree with that for sure. Um, and a role for the LNO as well in terms of communication products and so forth, which will, you know, only only really work as the sites 
come up with this content and the research stories and so forth. But um, yeah, I don't know if you have a comment on that or agree. Well, or I, think, agree. I think it's, you know, I would urge people if they're interested in dry lands or forests or marine systems, I would urge when the papers come out to, to look at those because there are sort of positive things and adverse effects, uh, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, I don't think Julie and I are doom and gloom types of people. It, it, very much, it's uh, it's sort of a mix. I think I think it's an area of concern because systems are changing, but sometimes they are working in the direction that makes a system more more resilient, and in other cases, uh, less resilient. So it's uh, it's a very complex uh, response. So I don't I don't think we want to give the impression that it's all negative stories, there are some positive aspects of it as well. But I think really what is is improved understanding how the systems function and how the organisms are responding to these changes and, and, and how, they're, how they're playing out and how they will continue to play out going forward. Um, so um, yeah, but that's a, that's a very good question. In, in giving this talk to various audiences, I've had people say, I was expecting to be really depressed but actually, when I heard this talk, I felt hopeful. And I think it's because what we are learning about <clears throat> ecosystems by watching them from a long-term ecological perspective is incredibly heartening because of all of the mechanisms in ecosystems that allow them to adapt to change. And so uh, certainly I completely echo Charlie's comment that our, <clears throat> our findings are not, um, doom and gloom they're about change it's happening and i think if we want to move forward aggressively in terms of adaptation and mitigation strategies i think having this basic understanding is absolutely critical to inform those types of uh decisions that we're going to have to make and deal with it in the future to try to do the the best job we can to try to improve resiliency i was encouraged that the renewal um, request for proposals from nsf emphasize the role of cross-site synthesis, which had been somewhat less obvious in um, the renewal proposal RFPs for about a decade. And I hope that <clears throat> the outcome of the 40 year review will acknowledge the incredible strength of the LTER network as a vehicle for synthesis. And so it's to be hoped that in the fifth decade, we'll get some encouragement both from <clears throat> NSF and uh, other sources uh, to, to continue the kind of synthesis work of which LTER is capable. A decade of synthesis. <laughs> Add one of right. those. Right on. Um, and just a final comment, and then I think we will wrap up um, and let our speakers get on with their day from Bobette Jones. Please let us know how to help uh, continued support or needs for LTER. Lots of money coming down the line for infrastructure that is related to climate, so. Yeah, and, and Marty responded, um, I think as well. So yeah, so I, I think we'll, we'll wrap up there again. I'll remind those of you who are still on the line um, and our speakers that, we, that this is recorded and it will end up on the LNO YouTube channel, which I put a link to in the, in the chat. And with that, you're getting lots of thanks in the chats, but Marty and I can thank you verbally and we can clap for everybody on behalf of all our participants and uh, attendees. So. Thank you so much for this um, presentation today and the rich discussion um, that followed. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Really yeah. nice work. Thanks. Great, great venue for this. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Marty and Jen. Of yes. Course. Okay. All right, then. Thanks to the attendees. And yes, we'll see you all next month at the final webinar of, the, of this series.